This is Art Sense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, I speak with artist Tamashi Jackson to discuss her life, her career, and her latest exhibit, Up Now at Night Gallery in Los Angeles. The conversation is a little longer than the usual episode, but well worth the listen. Jackson makes work that layers site-specific materials and imagery to make paintings that speak on many different levels. In our conversation, she takes time to share the lessons she's learned on the winding road that's taken her from South Central LA to destinations worldwide, while gathering degrees from Cooper Union, MIT, Yale, and a summer spin at Skowhegan. And now, observing life minute by minute with artist Tamashi Jackson. Tamashi Jackson, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Art Sense podcast. Uh, I know you've just wrapped up a big retrospective across the universe at MCA Denver. And we are about to launch Minute by Minute, uh, September 30th to November 4th at Night Gallery in L.A. But Tamashi, I usually like to start my conversations with the artists with a hypothetical, which is, let's say you're sitting at a dinner party next to somebody who has absolutely no idea who Tamashi Jackson is. They've never seen you work. They don't know what you do. How do you describe it to them? Uh, <laughs> I love this. Because it's not even hypothetical. It's actually a real lived experience as of late. And I'll try not to get into all. With... <laughs> but I've been meeting meeting strangers and uh, who like are not people inside of our uh, professional world. They do they do whatever they do in some other uh, professional realms. Uh, so yeah, how do I describe my work? Um, I am I'm an artist first. I'm a visual artist. Um, I make paintings mostly make paintings and I also make videos and uh, and I also like to knit. Um, uh, the work is um, more often than not driven by research. The research tends to be site specific. It allows me to ask questions about people, places, movements, things that I don't understand but would like to understand more fully. Um, I'm from Los Angeles. I was born in Texas and I'm from Los Angeles. I'm from Los Angeles of the eighties and nineties um, and uh, spent formative years in, in, uh, in the Bay area as well. My family stretches from Texas to Los Angeles to San Francisco. And um, so I'm, I find that I continue to be very influenced and very proud to be influenced by the, mur the cultural muralism that uh, was a wash uh, all around me uh, growing up. So my first experiences with painting uh, were always through monumentality, always through public space, always through public narratives and always heroic. Um, and uh, I don't always get to, I don't, I, it's very rare that I get to paint a mural these days or rather to work on a team uh, making a, a public mural happen in a traditional sense. But um, all of these, um, these, these, uh, you know, these circumstances that I couldn't help, you know, can't help where you're born or the people you're born to or the city that you're born in. But I happen to have grown up in a very beautiful, um, uh, complex, international city and um, with a mother who was a storyteller and a, um, a music lover and, um, uh, and a working class unionized person. So um, all of these things influence the way that I see the world and the, and the work that I make. But in its most simplest form, I make paintings, and um, and they're often big. Right. <laughs> often big. They're often still trying to reach back to that muralist tradition sure. um, in ways that allow, but in, but in ways that allow the work to to move around inside spaces. And so now the work, instead of instead of the work living on the outsides of buildings, um, they're in like public collections and museums and stuff. So the works, uh, I, I'm, my hope is that the work strategically operates and functions that serve the public uh, through the narratives that they focus on, through the places that they end up. And, you know, luckily, I, I, I saw I'm an artist that is represented by three galleries. I work with teams of amazing people. Um, we work a lot with museums. 
I'm also an educator, an arts educator, because I was educated by artists. Um, so yeah, my um, the, the way that I work maybe moves clockwise through a circle of, um, what is it like, quadrants or sections that all kind of like seek to seek to do the same thing, which is to use visual art um, uh, um, among other artists, among, uh, well, to use visual, and when I say among other artists, I'm also thinking about the large conservatory of disciplines. So right now I'm actually really interested in using the spaces that I'm trusted with, like uh, this space at Night Gallery, or when I'm back in New York at Tilton Gallery, or when I go to London and I'm at Pilar Correa's Gallery, or when you know I'm at MCA Denver or at um, uh, ICA Philadelphia or the University Art Gallery at Tufts, when I have access to space during this era of rapid displacement in the inner cities, you know uh, the the losing access to spaces where creative people have historically gotten together to experiment and to be in community with other people. I'm really interested in using the access that I've, I'm afforded to share that space mm -hmm. with people of other disciplines. So like we have a piano in here, there's gonna be musicians coming in here playing, we're gonna pay them to come play. Um, uh, a dear friend of mine who's a, a, a rather famous young opera director, we went to high school together to the arts. I'm a public school person mm -hmm. and I'm a private school person. I'm a beneficiary of the arts in education period from my elementary school years to uh, my high school years that shaped everything that's happened since then. So we have a dear friend of mine who's an opera director, Alexander Gideon, who's directing me. Um, and we're, we're, we're bringing theater into the gallery space. We're using the paintings, the space for the paintings as a stage to tell this story about my mother and I and our relationship uh, to music. So um, yeah, I'm a visual artist and, and, um, and I'm from mid-city Los Angeles. And I was born in Houston, Texas. Well, there, there is so much to unpack there, Tamashi. Uh, no, 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 there's, I mean, there, there's like a dozen questions I, I want to ask you about California. I want to ask you about, uh, place and storytelling and, um, and materiality and, and, you know, how about we start here? How much, how much paint does it take for a, a painting to be called a painting? Because oh lord, you see what I'm saying? Like your your work. I don't see what you're saying. <laughs> because your your work, it's not. I mean, if if you would tell somebody, oh, I'm a painter, that that you know, that's a different impression than what a lot of your work looks like, right? You you mm -hmm. your work takes on these different forms, and a lot of it has all types of media, right? So can can you talk a little bit about how you combine these different media to make to make an object? What what leads you? What what directs you? The work does and I'm not trying to sound all, you know, annoying or emo, although I do also identify as an emo person from the 90s. At my best and at my most available, um, I'm trying, I'm trying to get most of me out of the way so that I can be a good steward for whatever the work needs. And um, I, I, I benefit from years and years of, oh gosh, being wild, you know, like having room to be wild, having room to be confused and still be held and uh, seen and um, embraced by uh, artist mentors who weren't necessarily, you know, we weren't, I, I wasn't seeking mentorship exactly, you know, that, you know, we were able to meet each other in the before times. And I say that before social media, you know, like uh, I, I had these encounters with people um, that could see me better than I could see myself. And it's been happening here in Los Angeles since um, I would count those first interactions being in elementary school at 32nd Street, USC Magnet School for the Performing and Visual Arts in the middle of the USC Village. I would only come to understand in my, what is it? Uh, what is that? My 2014 to 2016, so between 34 and 36, I came to finally understand that the magnet schools 
uh, the Centers for Enriched Studies, you know, these public schools that were like spaces that were specialized uh, in the buses that got me there, um, that that was all a part of a broad, far reaching strategy to desegregate schools and increase educational access. Um, I didn't understand that. You know, I didn't understand the, how it, it, it felt like I was in something special, but I did not understand the historic nature of that radicality. Um, so, um, yeah, so years and years, many years of uh, being able to see myself as an artist and knowing that that was serious. And so, so like whether or not that made sense to everyone around me, um, I just became okay with that not mattering so much. And um, and so I arrive at this place today where I know what my needs are. I know what this. I know what my needs are to make to set up the space to make the work. And if I can, if I can, I've, I've worked um, in temporary studios. You know, from tw from summer twenty nineteen, uh, summer twenty nineteen, I was at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, and then I did a project at uh, VCU at the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University ICA. And then I went to Athens, Greece with the ARC Athens residency. It was in a little townhouse and set up a little workspace there. And then I came here to Los Angeles for my first night gallery show, Forever My Lady, and they put me in a temporary studio. And then I went back to Massachusetts where I've, where I've been living for 13 years. And, um, and then COVID happened. I went there to start a project uh, at, at the uh, Harvard Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. And then COVID happened and everything was shut down. And eventually I was able to gain access to a gallery, gallery, my mind always wants to say gallery 825 because I'm from Los Angeles. <laughs> and that was one of the first galleries I was like, you know, trying to get interested in me when I was younger, but gallery, oh gosh, it'll come, it'll come back to me and I'll be able to offer this. This is because they're very special. A small community gallery in Cambridge allowed me to rent space from them for two months and during that time, I made my my show, my solo show at the Wexner Center, Love Roller Coaster. Um, and then I worked in the basement of the Radcliffe when they opened up again. And then and then I packed up a car and made work at the Watermill Center uh, for the arts for my show at the Parish Museum. So that's all to say that these challenges have come. You know, life comes, but I always need to make work, and I have confidence now especially after being at Yale for two years and having a studio of my own that wasn't a bedroom, it wasn't a cubicle, it wasn't a swing space, it wasn't a basement, it wasn't it wasn't a garage, but a real, you know, white walls, concrete floor, access to water, this is what it's for. So now I can move through the world and I can identify quietly, kind of like the, the way that whoever's playing the piano in there just knows how to play the piano quietly inside of myself. I can be in a space and know whether or not I can work in it or how I can make it work. My job is to make it work, make the space work. So then whatever else is happening, whatever else is happening, wherever else my body has been in the name of working, like I'm going to London soon um, to start to whatever. And, or I went to Colorado, let's see. I go to play, I get, I'm, I'm able to move around in spaces where I don't have to know anything. I don't have to have a familial link or connection that often actually complicates things such as such coming home to Night Gallery, coming home to Los Angeles and making shows here is, it, maybe one day I'll be able to make a show that's like not so emotionally charged, but this is my hometown and, I, and I've been here, my people have been here for generations now. And so it's just, it's always mixed up with that. I can't be dispassionate about it, but these things define what I'm useful for. You know, the gathering of the information, the, you know, putting myself in situations to ask questions. And then, you know, I have this muscle memory for what physically needs to happen for me to be in a space and to make paintings. The other thing that defines what makes the, what the painting is made of is the materiality of the place. How can I imbue, how can I embed site specificity, symbolic and materially into the surface? Um, with, with Georgia, it was, you know, diving into a, into a pit that was left after a community center was raised for the building of condos next door to where I was staying. I climbed into that hole. The further I went down into that hole, the redder the soil got. I scooped up that soil and, in, in, um, what is it? Those, uh, Talenti and some of those, uh, a couple of Talenti jars empty. Of course, there was not, you know, gelato in there, The gelato was gone. But I, you know, I, I, I take as much of it as I can before running to the airport and I screw it, screw it on. And I, you know, ask the person who's hosting me to, to mail it to me. That becomes, you know, like my first time, my or really my second time, like starting to like intentionally like whip up a paste out of earth to embed into uh, the surface 
the surfaces, which at that time were primarily made of voting ephemera, um, it has to be able to survive me, us, you, um, in order to continue to do whatever work it has. It's my job to make sure that it's strong, um, materially strong and materially, um, uh, that it has integrity. Um, and then, you know, so I find that like, if I, if I can get all these things, if I'm sensitive enough and stay out of the way, you know, if I can just like stay as much out of the way as possible, if that even makes sense, if I can keep myself working for what the needs are based on what I've been exposed to for a given project, then if I'm, if I'm lucky, then I get to just be a steward for these things to come into the world and I try to um, I try to respect their individuality. I think of them when I'm in the studio that seven is my magic number, I think. But I did. I was able to make 10 pieces for this show. And I just try to I really, 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 really try to respect them because I can get really nervous. Obviously, you probably can tell, like I could talk. I can like I think too much, you know, like I don't relax very often. So like I can really I can really impose a lot of um, a lot of my own SHIT into the space. I could really impose a lot of expectations um, beyond what I've learned so far that could intrude upon what their needs are. Or, or because I, 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 I like the comfort of regularity, I could make everything the same. I could keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And so what's really, what I'm really excited about um, with uh, this, this current show with Minute by Minute is that um, I really, 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 really try to let each one of them be what they needed to be um, and not just like, you know, be hypnotized by their beauty to like make the same beauty happen over and over again. You know, like that they can all be, you know, try to like, you know, what parents are supposed to say, I don't have any favorites. Right, <laughs> right, right. Oh, but that, you know, they're all individuals. Yeah. Some of them are small. Sure. I tried to let some of them be small this time. I tried to, you know, um, only five of them, five of them are on um, on name style frames. Which you know, I've, it's 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 a it's a methodology and a and a logic and an ethos that I've I've come by quite honestly. Sure. Um, and it's something that I, it's a really it's a that structure, the right triangle coming out of the wall, um, inviting that the painting be considered uh, as sculpture. The the draping of um, archival digitally printed PVC vinyl um, with half tone lines that are intended to cross hatch with the halftone lines that are painted in another direction. I love it. I mean, it's, it's, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all whispers to people, to, to my people, you know, sure. it's whispers to the people who taught me printmaking. It's whispers, it's whispers to the people who know these things. And it's also whispers to, 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 to all of us who respond to color, form, shape, and line. Um, I love that they project colored light onto the wall. I love that um, I can see, I can hear Sarah Oppenheimer, you know, like like changing my brain with her presence, uh, with her generosity in the studio with me, um, talking about you know the fact that painting is about light. Right. Painting is about light. So you know some of these paintings they're only complete when the light is cast upon them and they project their light onto the wall underneath the structure, making a complete image system. Right. Um, and then and then and then one of them is a is a palette. It's a little palette that the guys at the Yule Quarry used to send me three big buckets of marble dust. And I took that inspired by um, Edgar Arsenault, um, took that palette and primed it with, uh, you know, my gesso paste, mm -hmm. <laughs> my marble paste and polymer gesso. And I painted, um, projected an image that my mother took of trees, of leaves and painted it into the surface and that's it. And I think, and I, and I was painting, thinking about painting, learning how to paint fresco with Oscar Rene Cornejo and remembering that um, it's really about, um, you know, to really allow the light of the surface mm -hmm. to talk means uh, employing the pigment sometimes just almost as just water, sure. just thin, 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 thin yeah. pigment. Um, so I don't know what I, yeah, no, I mean, whatever it needs, yeah. whatever it needs. Uh, well, you know, you mentioned, uh, Edgar Arsenault and I was just about to mention Edgar Arsenault because in my conversation with Edgar, it really reminded me of, of your conversation about research and, uh, these lost histories, which, you know, was also part of my conversation with, uh, Tavera Strawn, right? This, you know, lo these lost histories, this research, 
how how difficult is it to find these historical analogies, these stories, when when it seems they've been intentionally omitted from traditional history? Well, for for example, like your your project about like Seneca Village, that that that's not yeah, that's that hard. Yeah, I mean that that's that not hard. a story. That, <laughs> That's not a story, you know. I was that was in my tenth grade uh, textbook, right? The uh, time out of mind was my second show at Tilton Gallery in New York City that coincided with the 2019 Whitney Biennial. So all of my work from that time was focused on uh, Seneca Village, kind of like um, a kind of um, yeah. That was hard. That was hard. You know, I started off at the Schomburg. I didn't know that there were no images. Because it's this is you know we're 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 in the realm the historic realm and beyond of the early daguerreotype, so it's not that photography doesn't exist. I didn't know that there were no pictures. What happens, you know? Um, so yeah. So what does the work need, and what is the work supposed to be? Oh boy, because. Uh, there, like with this show, there were moments that I didn't know with that project. I did not know, I kind of stumbled into exposure to a narrative and then I started notice, noticing that it was repeating. Um, so I, I, I was still on Facebook at the time. I had not weaned from Facebook yet. And I came across these articles in what was then called Kings County Politics, um, an online periodical, an online newspaper, a digital newspaper. And I was seeing these articles like coming out in real time about um, the New York City foreclosure scandal um, where um, fully paid for properties were being seized by the city and, uh, and handed over to what was the third party transfer program. So contemporary journalists, uh, um, Lisa um, Mena, um, oh my goodness, am I gonna mess this up? Kelly, that's right. She has a front sister. So contemporary journalists, Kelly Mena, Stephen Witt, and Shubasa Berg were the only people covering these stories of uh, mostly Black, Latinx people, um, Black and Latinx people, not that they're mutually exclusive. Um, in fast gentrifying boroughs in New York City were waking up to notices on their door saying um, uh, this property is now under the management of XYZ. Uh, you either need to get out or you now pay rent to them or something like that. And these are, you know, like properties that had been in people's families for three or four generations, not just single family homes, whole apartment buildings, co-ops. Um, and in some cases, you know, maybe, uh, you know, people were told that uh, property taxes hadn't been paid or water bill hadn't been paid. And they look back through their records and they've been on top of it. Or if someone wasn't on top of it, it was really, really, really minor. Like, you know, like the Social Security didn't like money didn't stretch or something like that. And you know, maybe the delinquency for the water bill was like $75. I think in one story it was just $75. But there were things happening unbeknownst to these property owners, these clustered foreclosures where um, uh, it was being decided that um, like a whole block would come under scrutiny and a cluster, I'm like, I'm, imagine like I'm, 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 I am have a, a handful of wheat, you know, just like a cluster of uh, foreclosures were taken before a judge. I think Judge Portnow, Portnow was the one who was just signing off on them in Brooklyn court. And um, yeah, the New York Times was not covering this. No other periodical was covering this except for uh, Kelly, Stephen, and Shubasa. Shubasa was uh, photographing Kelly and, uh, and Stephen, uh, interviewing people. Once people in the communities, this is the Bronx, this is Brooklyn, um, once people in the communities knew that there were some journalists who were who were writing about it who were taking it seriously, then they were flooded because nobody else was listening to these people. So when I heard about that, when I read about that, I was like, this is crazy. This this sounds like what I've heard about Seneca Village. I don't know much. I don't know much of anything at all. But it sounds like what I've heard about what happened to the space that becomes Central Park. 
So then I go to my alma mater, Cooper Union, that has a, a big, beautiful library, modest and beautiful and incredible, incredible, incredible librarians who still, you know, know my, know, know my face and know my name. And I think at the time I was there uh, sitting in, I was, I was teaching a drawing class and a painting seminar, just coming through and like, I think the beautiful thing about the community of artists that I come from is that um, every, everyone is serious. <laughs> You know, my best friend reminds me, my best friend is not an artist, which is great, but um, she's a she's an economist and a policy wonk. Um, but she has to remind me that, you know, not everyone has the experience of like of being near or friends with a professional artist. Um, why am I mentioning that? Um, yeah, I mentioned that because in my life, because this is my life and this is all I've ever wanted. And this is this was. This was serious to me before I knew that, you know, we would ever have a conversation like this or that that you would that you would exist somewhere and care enough to facilitate conversations like these. It was a it was a dream of mine that this was a reality. If, if I was going to sit in my room and just be super serious alone until I found people who were serious, that's what I was going to do. So, um, you know, I live in this reality in which like uh, the, the artists and the educators that I know who are like super nerdy and super serious about this stuff, sometimes they need other artists that they trust to come in and teach a class for them while they go and do a residency or while they go and do a project or, you know, Guggenheim or whatever. So I was in New York at the time and I was, and I had taken a drawing class and a painting class to cover somebody else. So I was at Cooper again. And, um, and I suddenly had these questions um, about Seneca Village. So I went to the library in between classes and I asked them to help me. I just told them exactly what I just told you. And um, and when I came back from my class, they had left green slips of paper throughout the stacks for me to see for where I should go, where they think I should go for, you know, like anything. And it was really, again, that's when I started to understand how hard this was going to be. Um, they found like, you know, books about Central Park, but, it, you know, most of them didn't acknowledge Seneca Village, except for the park and the people by uh, Rosenzweig and Blackmore, published by Cornell University Press in 1996. That was the first um, of all the historic publications about the creation and maintenance of Central Park and the purpose of Central Park. That's the, That was the first publication in 1996 to acknowledge that there had been a village there. And I learned from my policy wonk friend to always read the acknowledgments and always read the forewords. I used to always skip those. I used to always skip those. So I, I, I painstakingly read the acknowledgments and the forwards, and I started to see the names of people who helped them in the, you know, in the departments of records in New York City. And they named them exactly, you know, thank you. Without, without this, we wouldn't have known about, you know, Seneca Village or whatever. Um, and it's only, it's, it's, it's not like there's like a whole like thick chapter on Seneca Village. They're just tidbits in those first in the forward, the acknowledgments, and the I think it's like chapter three or something like that. And then with that, I was off and running. The next place I thought I should go, obviously, was the Schomburg Center for uh, uh, African American Research, and there was nothing there. I mean, there were no there were no images there. I needed images. Um, so yeah, sometimes it is uh, some that that one was particularly hard, um, and it was the the diligent work of contemporary journalists who were stand alone, who did not have a print press. They were just doing it. They were just doing it when no one else was doing it. And um, yeah, so like my my cues for what what is supposed to happen has, you know, what's supposed to happen with the project has so much to do with my ability to, um, again, like to, to be enough out of the way to catch patterns, um, you know, and things that I'm hearing and things that I'm seeing. And, um, and you know, I, I've, I've so far, I've been really lucky with people being being generous with me. You know, those journalists came to my studio and we talked, you know, I read everything that they did and then I contacted them and they were open to meeting with me and uh, they they came to the Whitney and we did, a, we did an incredible talk together. That education program that we did for that biennial is out of control. Like we needed another two hours for, for question and answer because we were all just like, stunned at what happened when, when Whitney Education, um, when Megan and um, and Andrew, while I was at Skowhegan, we were working together with really them. It was really them. I told them who I wanted and they found all these people. We had we had uh, 
uh, Marie uh, Warsh from the Central Park Conservancy, uh, who you know had walked me through Central Park and talked about Seneca Village and told me else who else I need to talk to the archaeologist who first identified the Black women led archaeologists that first identified that that site needed to be protected and um, and unearthed and cataloged. Uh, we had them. We had my friend Kay Sue Park, who's a professor uh, of foreclosure, who focuses on foreclosure law. She's a professor at, at Georgetown now, who wrote um, uh, Money, Mortgages, and the Conquest of America, um, that had just recently been released in um, uh, the American Bar Association Journal on Social Policy or something like that. I'll send it to you. But it was collecting these people. But it was collecting these people because uh, because Sue's, while Kesu focuses on contemporary uh, um, uh, foreclosure, her paper, which was kicking up a lot of dust at the time, addressed the fact that historically, indigenous communities, indigenous people who were here to the tunes of you know tens of millions of people who were here already in this place that didn't be need, didn't can't count it as discovered because there was already people here. Um, had their own systems of exchange and of value and of, of currency that are often um, almost always removed from the historic record as sentient agents and actors in their own lives. They're described as savages who needed to be civilized. So K. Sue's paper was groundbreaking at the time because she looked back through these annals of history and, uh, and, 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 and did the research to fill those, to reconsider those narratives. It's a, it's a wild and amazing paper about how um, English property law, it, it, for English property law, it was not possible to alienate a male heir from their property, that um, the foreclosure was, a, was, a, was an invention, an innovation of colonialism to alienate indigenous people, to rationally and alienate indigenous people from their land. Um, so she's there at the Whitney for the talk. Marie from the Central Park Conservancy is there. The archaeologists, uh, the archaeologists are there. The journalists are there bringing it into full contemporary context. And then the artist Tourmaline was there, who is the only artist to my knowledge, to any of our knowledge, to ever make a film visualizing Seneca Village through the eyes of a Black trans woman whose life is identifiable through her arrest records. Tourmaline made a film out of that. Um, Salacia, which she gives us like a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a little bit of that and talks about that. The talk was, I mean, everybody was just like gasping for air because bringing that, you know, that history of the 1800s into the full present. So it's not just me sitting in my studio rocking back and forth. Like I see a historic collapse here. I see a historic collision here. Oh my God. Oh my God. How do I articulate this? But the being able to work in partnership with a public facing culture institution like the Whitney and, um, and, the, and, and working with the education department to bring all these generous people together I mean, it's, that's, it's just, yeah. So like what turned out to be very difficult ended up being incredibly rewarding. I hate to change topics. You know, there's part of your story I, I really want to talk to you about because it's it's kind of been top of mind recently. I, I was at the grocery store the other day and I ran into uh, someone that had been an art student of mine and she's in her early 20s now. She had looked at going to SCAD. She didn't get in. That was her goal. That was her one goal to go to SCAD. And when she didn't get in, now she's working at the grocery store. And, you know, even in my conversation with William Kentridge recently, he, he talked about throwing in the towel on being an artist when he was in his mid-20s. He sold his printing yeah. press. He moved to Paris to study acting. And he said it was because he didn't have anything to say. And I guess... Yeah. You know, when I look yeah. at your story, there's there's a gap between Art Institute of San Francisco and Cooper Union. And, you Dang, know, you are up in the well, business. Well, wow. <laughs> well, I'm just and so in my mind, I, I was going to have to answer for those years. One no, day. I no. But it. the thing is, like, <laughs> it, it looks so much, you know, you you could have lost heart. You know, can you talk about the stops and starts in your career? Yeah. What changed Somebody was there. You mentioned the these yeah. amazing artists that mm -hmm. came alongside you. Somebody encouraged you. What happened in in that time? And because the last ten years for you have been probably more than you could have ever anticipated. Yeah. So twenty thirteen. Yeah. So I graduated from from MIT. 
you know, it's really, really hard. It's really hard. I did not know that I was the first black person to matriculate through this program when I, or to be in this program as a graduate student when I went into it. Um, and uh, I wouldn't have assumed it to be so um, culturally uh, difficult in the ways that it was. It was very, very, very stressful. It's very, very difficult. I value it all now because the pain of it forced me to lean into lean into listening to to people, well, to one particular person. Yeah, so my best friend is a policy researcher, um, education policy. She went to Cornell right out of high school. I went to the San Francisco Art Institute right out of high school. And when I got there, again, you know, like I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an emo chick from the '90s. When I get to San Francisco by Greyhound bus, um, not even knowing how deep my family's history is in, in San Francisco at that point. I thought my grandparents just happened to live there, but that's actually one of the first places that my great grand people came or that my great aunts came when they came from Texas. But I'm just like walking the streets. And at the time when I left high school, I remember thinking, what is my mission? You know, quite, you know, I can say this now, but it, you know, sometimes it would feel kind of silly in years past to say this, like just too, again, just like too emotional, too naive. But as a young person, I really was thinking, what is my artistic mission? What is my mission? And um, and I looked up and, I, you know, the Greyhound station in San Francisco is on Mission Street. I didn't know that yet, you know? So I'm like walking around by myself. And I look up and I'm, you know, just, just walking around and wondering. Because we deserve, we all deserve like the time to be aimless and wonder. You know what I mean? Like to not consider every step as a zero sum game. So I'm like walking and thinking to myself, what is my mission? What am I supposed to do? As an artist, what am I supposed to do? And I look up and I see that I'm on Mission Street or Boulevard, yeah, Mission, yeah. Mission, Mission Avenue. I, I'm on, I'm on, I'm in the mission. So I keep walking and I find myself not just on mission, but I'm now right. in the mission. And at some point I'm just looking around and the murals are becoming more and more plentiful. I'm seeing paintings on buildings. And so I just keep going further into it. And then I look over to the right and I can't help, but like, it's like, it's, it's almost like the sun shining on the side of my face. I just feel this like this color, this heat that just like draws my attention to the right. And it's the women's building that is completely wrapped in paintings from top to bottom of historic women. And, you know, it ends up being that I'm living in the home in the spare room of uh, Omolade uh, Roddy Figueroa, who is best friends since the 70s. When she left Los Angeles, she moved to San Francisco, lived in the hate, became best friends with Juana and all these girls, and they helped each other raise their children together. And so the next night, she takes me to a party at Juana's house in Berkeley that is now, now I'm seeing the original drawings of this mural. I'm seeing like whole painted tables. I'm seeing like his, history of the of art being made. Just, every, just like one of those homes that like gets you excited, like to be in, like, like wow, who are these people? And I'm, my mouth is just like, you know, hanging open. I'm just, I just can't believe it. I can't believe my luck. And she ends up taking me under her wing and um, allowing me to join her in uh, teaching classes at Oakland, at Oakland, um, what is it, Oakland Tech Technical High School. She had created an organization called the East Bay Institute for Urban Arts. Um, I found myself, um, oh, it was a place for, it was like an after school and Saturday school for, for urban arts across the disciplines. Um, you know, really compensating for the generationally continuous divestment of arts and humanities in public schools. So how are we showing up with, the, with, with answers? How are we showing up as artists with solutions? How are we on mission? How are we on the mission? And I found myself just completely dropped into this world. And her husband, her then husband was a professor of printmaking at the San Francisco Art Institute. And my grandparents lived in San Francisco. So, you know, I was just as happy as I could be. I felt as secure as a person could. And when I found that I was like not, you know, San Francisco Art Institute it was an incredible, incredible school with a true avant-garde history uh, of, of, of San Francisco film and of performance, the, the, the origin site of new genres, Tony Labatt, George Kuchar, Al Wong, um, uh, uh, gosh, there's, I can't even, oh gosh, there's one, oh, I'm, I'm kicking myself. There's so many people. Tamashi, I'm so I'm so impressed by your ability to remember people's names 
in the names of publications. Like you're, you're just like a walking bibliography. I'm there's one person. A, um, Oh, Dewey Crumpler who was painting murals in um, Hunter's Point. See, you could be making all these names up. <laughs> and but there, but it's good because you can look them up and you can know this. And um, oh, it's just, it's not coming to me. So, so I was, I was less inspired. I found that, I found that I didn't know what I was supposed to paint. When I was at SFAI, Kahende Wiley was there. He and I had been at the same high school, but we had missed each other because our high school was three years and he was, so I was learning about him and knowing about what a great painter he was when I was 15 because he had already graduated. So a whole bunch of us from the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts ended up going to SFAI. There were SFAI people who were our painting teachers. And so we kind of, we had a lot of schools to choose from. Like, like the young person that you're talking about at the grocery store, being exposed to the possibility of being in places where people take art seriously is a game changer. Maybe it's not supposed to be SCAD. You know, maybe she's supposed to go to Cooper Union. Maybe they're supposed to go to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and be attached to a whole museum. You know, maybe there's another city, but the fact that we have these options is just extraordinary. So a bunch of us ended up at, in San Francisco. I, my, my dream school was Cooper Union, but I was afraid to leave the West Coast. I was afraid to not be near my family. But I found myself just in this whole uh, ecosystem. There were DJs, there were poets, there were filmmakers, um, uh, and, and there were muralists, there were activists, and um, I found myself more and more excited. Oh, and the graffiti artist that I ran around with at night. There was there. I found myself more and more inspired by the city, by what was alive in the city among working class people. Before this is, and this is why that historic dot com dot com housing bubble is so important because after that, a lot of that changes. So many people get forced out. But I was there at a time where I could drop out of school and keep working. I could, and this was before 9-11. So there was like funding for public murals. So long as artists knew how to get together and 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 uh, write grants for that money, like we had all these projects going on and then 9-11 happened and it all dried up. What do you say to the artist that thought they had a particular trajectory in their mind about how it was gonna go and mm -hmm. they feel like they've gotten sidetracked? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I relate to that experience, uh, so, 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 so much. Uh, what would I say? Um, that it's going to be okay, that it's going to be all right. And that, uh, an artist, if an artist is what you are, then an artist is what you are. And, uh, you know, I didn't want school. Um, I didn't want my fear, my own fear of the world and my own fear of being away from my family. Um, to drive my desire to be in school and thus for my relationship to school to be what defined my uh, my uh, understanding of myself as an artist. You know, I, when I was like, what was it, 19, 18, 18 to 19, I was at San Francisco Art Institute. 19, I signed the deferment papers. And... And I remember thinking, um, you know, am I doing this? Am I am I at this school because I have work to do here, and and it and that I I have something to contribute art historically. That am I am I am I here because of that? Because of some you know mission, internally driven mission, or am I here because I'm afraid to be in the world otherwise? Am I here because I'm afraid that I don't have what it takes to be an artist? I don't even know what that means, but you know, like. Uh, Am I here because I'm afraid or am I here because I'm because I'm here on purpose? And when I couldn't answer that question, I signed those deferment papers. And as soon as I signed those deferment papers, I began painting. Like before that, I felt like I didn't know what to paint. And coming from a working class family, um, a working class household, uh, um, I, I felt extremely guilty receiving helpful money from my mother, you know, $200 a month from my mother. And I didn't, I didn't feel like I know what I was, I knew what I was doing. Now, I also have a completely different appreciation for education and art education and art education communities now that I understand that the spaces are vulnerable, that they're not impervious. You know, San Francisco Art Institute was one of the oldest art colleges in the country and it's, it was, and it's shuttered, you know? So it's like at the time in 1998, 1999, um, everything seemed really permanent. 
Um, and, you know, now I have a different appreciation for the value of these spaces as places for us to go and build community. It's not a place to go and have a, you know, spitting contest necessarily. <laughs> you know, it's like it, it can be that for some for some folks. But I find I find returning to the educational spaces for that are focused on art after seven years of deferment, after seven years of apprenticeship, of you know, stumbling and falling and of always making. You know, as soon as I signed the deferment papers, I suddenly knew what to make. I was picking up pieces of wood and reconsidering them as surfaces from the streets and taking them home. And I lived in an apartment with an incredible colorist, uh, Vicky Del Rosario, and we would paint until, you know, the wee hours. My I had an open door policy. Um, I lived in um, the Fillmore in San Francisco around the corner from my grandparents and uh, around the corner from the club that was then called the Justice League. It's now called the Independent. All the most incredible acts from New York, from everywhere and from up from Los Angeles, everybody would like coalesce in this neighborhood where I happened to feel comfortable because I've been visiting my entire life because my because my mm -hmm. grandmommy and my granddaddy lived there. You know, so I felt like um, uh, I had an open door policy. People would just be welcome to come on by and hang out while I painted. I worked at Pearl Art uh, Art Supply Store on, on, on Market Street. Um, I had really good supplies, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's like the I, I, I got to see that, um, you know, me making in the world was really not defined and not meant to be defined by my acceptance in, in an educational situation. And that when I went back, when I chose to go back, when my body felt like it was time for me to go back, it was only after when I reached a place when I was teaching, I was teaching art at a private school and I had run through everything that I could possibly give back to those children. Everything that my, my, uh, my magnet school visual arts teachers gave gave us in 1987, having us start off um, with self portraits and drawing each other, and um, you know the mentorship I received from uh, a Los Angeles painter and multimedia artist Barry Markowitz, uh, uh, Judith Baca being an inspiration with uh, the murals that are that were painted all over Los Angeles, and just everything. I tried to give them everything. The figure drawing that I got at LA County High School for the Arts from Harry Lemay and Joseph Gatto. Um, and then when I couldn't answer their questions without drawing on top of their work, you know, they had, they had questions about defining space. And I realized that I didn't know how to answer those questions. I didn't know, I didn't know how to communicate to someone else, how we were going to observe and recreate a horizon line. Um, you know, when I, when I wasn't able to answer their questions anymore, that's when my body clicked and it was like, it's time to go back to school. So Craig, something that I've come to uh, my, my experiences, uh, you know, off track, right. Cause I had friends, who, I have friends who are like famous artists now who went straight through, you know, prodigies who went, you know, high arts, high school to art college, to graduate school, to like excellent representation and magazine covers and stuff. I've seen that. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen all different ways that people show up inside of a creative economies and creative expression and, and identification in the public world. And um, so there were moments when I literally thought that I ruined everything by dropping out of school. You know, there were moments of like deep depression and uncertainty and fear. Um, but what I have found um, that I really value, I found like towards the end of my time at Cooper, that um, my collection of experiences showed me patterns. I, I have to learn by doing. I'm someone who has to learn by doing. I learn by doing and making. Um, and, and through these adventures, I found that for me, I believe in the, I believe that there's a cyclical nature to a robust and productive creative practice. Uh, that there's a time for learning. If you think of it as a circle with, with you know, pies cut out of it, um, there's a time for, you know, mentorship, be, uh, there's a, being the mentee, there's a time for, you know, uh, studying history, understanding what's happened before, uh, and what's happening now, understanding discipline and practice, uh, processes. There's a time for making public work that is available to everyone, no matter whether or not they can afford it, you know, and that's the muralist tradition that defined how I came to understand how to see myself in the world in California. It's everybody, everyone who has eyes can see it. Um, and then there are other ways to reconsider publicness for people who are sight, who are, who, who, who can't see, you know, like that's the beauty of, of a public effort uh, and of addressing issues of public concern. How, how can, 
can fellow implicated parties be, be brought in? That's the challenge, right? So then there's a time to be focused on challenges like that. And then there's the then there then there's the work that work that that making work that operates inside of a person's home, like the, those paintings that are switching behind you or across your shoulder that I can see. That's there that that that's medicine. When I was younger, I thought you know I'm very you know again, just an emo girl from the '90s. Uh, just you know very emotional terms. How can how can the work function as a strategic, positive piece of medicine that can live in an intimate space? with other people and the people who are close to them and do its work there. Um, and then there's the work of um, being, in a, being a teacher's apprentice. How can I support learning spaces for the arts? Um, and then there's leading. How do I lead a learning space for the arts? And then there's sabbatical. You know, when do I rest and absorb my own observations of the world? And then when do I do research? You know, when do I just go and do research and just learn about a thing in a place? So I had all these experiences kind of like organically. When one thing was ending, you know, one teaching gig was ending or one teacher's assistant uh, gig was ending and I was starting to panic, um, something else would appear, you know? And so it just kept happening like that. And so now I see that each stop on that, in that cycle prepares one for what's happening three cycles out. Um, so it's all valuable. So what I would say to someone who like me thought that they did the wrong thing and that they messed everything up and that they're off track and, and, you know, everything's ruined. <laughs> you know, I wanted to be, I had a fantasy that I would have like, you know, mature work and, you know, retrospective worthy work when I was like 21 and when I didn't get that, I completely fell apart. You know, when I was living at home, back at home with my mother, um, totally confused about what I was doing or what I was supposed to do, crying, crying, and, and crying in a language that my mother, you know, my my um, my uh, operating engineer, my unionized operating engineer mother, she's like, what is wrong with you? You know, like, we're not even speaking the same language. But I had uh, artist mentors who were in my life, I could call them crying. And I was like, do you ever feel like, um, do you ever feel like you're you're not doing what you're supposed to do? You know, it's like, I had those people that I could call. And, you know, sometimes the advice was clean your room. Sometimes the advice was go outside, go for a walk. Sometimes the advice is check on somebody else and see how you can be of service. You know, all of these things uh, prepare one for what's, for what's coming next. And earlier in our conversation, I mentioned that, um, after I after I graduated from MIT, another like moment of like deep uncertainty about what I was supposed to do next. I ended up looking after children for three different families in Cambridge for three years, and uh, you know my life ended up mirroring my research, and my research was about my family as a part of a global economic body of domestic and informal laborers who uphold the formal economy. Suddenly, I was doing that, you know, to survive, and um, uh, and the things that happened. The things that the, there are things that that experience led me to learn how to knit. And then that led me to, oh, I, what I something I forgot to mention before is I did. I looked after children and then once a month I edited video for Otto Pina and his wife, the uh, the um, the the poet Elizabeth Goldring. We had become close while I was at MIT and they were doing this project with Robert Wilson. And I was the I was the one person who took the video. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, everybody else wanted to, you know, be in the Robert Wilson show. And I was like, someone's got a document. And I was actually really salty about it at the time. Cause I was like, I want to do stuff too, but if nobody's documenting, then this won't be documented. And so I ended up getting a call from Otto Pina after I graduated, you know, all sad again, sad girl, sad girl. I have no money. I have no computers. I can't do anything. I went to MIT a school about technology. I can't afford technology. I've ruined everything again. I made the wrong decisions again. And I get a call from Otto Pina, who's a real artist. He's like, I'm, now that everything's calmed down, um, it's time to get back to work. That's what I've learned from the real, the real deal generational artists that I've, that I've, I've been so blessed to, to, to touch the hems of, to, to work alongside of. You just always get back to work. It doesn't matter if anybody's looking. It does not matter if anybody's looking. You just, you do the work. And so Otto pulls me back in. I think that they were paying me like 15 or maybe, maybe it was like $20 an hour to edit video. Uh, Elizabeth Goldring is legally blind. So Otto and I were working together to make this poetic video piece. And we were her eyes. And um, 
Yeah. And then eventually they took me to Germany with them to assist, uh, to assist them both for a few weeks in the summer of, of uh, 2013. And when I came back, uh, you know, after some very good conversations with Otto about what it was like to emerge from World War II with nothing, and that the Zero Group was about coming back from nothingness, was about making and being in community and responding to space that was rubble, that was nothing. Here I am bemoaning the fact that I can't afford a new computer. And Otto was like, we had nothing. We had nothing, but an artist can always make the mark. You can always make a mark. You can always take something and turn it into something else. Thus, we get Otto's fire paintings. We get the inflatable sky art that's made out of uh, parachute material. We get the light ballet that is all about him him and others hovering in bullet riddled buildings with, with spotlights coming through them. Everything, everything that he ended up making was about how much he wanted peace. So I came back from Germany as George Zimmerman was acquitted of killing Trayvon Martin, and I felt physically ill when I re-entered the United States. And I had to make a self-portrait because that's all I had. You know, I had I had leftover mylar from my time at Cooper. I had um, uh, I had been collecting uh, wrappers from the children's snacks that I would prepare every day. And I made a self-portrait and that self-portrait led to other portraits of other domestic workers in Cambridge. And then with that, I applied, I ended up applying to Yale very quietly, very quietly, mostly just because I wanted to be once again around people who take painting seriously. So like the always making, even, no matter what I think, it doesn't matter what I think the track is actually, but whatever is making in response to whatever life is presenting with us will, will for me, I, in my experience, it will provide the guideposts that Sometimes only I can see and only I can understand. Sometimes my family would not understand, you know, why I'm being driven or, you know, lured in this direction or that. But um, but if I'm always working and, and, and um, appreciating what if I'm always appreciating what the work can tell me, then um, in my experience, I've not been steered wrong. You know, like I, like and it's and, and, and not being in school is not giving up. You know, not being in school does not mean that you're not an artist. Being at school doesn't mean that you're an artist. Being an artist means that you're an artist. And the 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 people, the people who really caught me when I got home to Los Angeles, the person who really caught me uh, was Barry Markowitz. I feel he's an extremely undersung, um, incredible uh, multimedia artist and a committed painter. And uh, for years, he's been the, the chair and the co-chair of the visual arts department at the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts. And he... Uh, he, um, he kind of, um, I forget, I, I completely blacked this out, but his wife, Wendy, uh, who's a, who's an art, who's an art educator, art history educator. Um, we go back to my last years in high school when, um, their son was my prom date. And, um, when I came home to Los Angeles, I came back to them. They're like an extension of family for me. And, uh, they're like, what are you doing, Tamashi? What are you going to do? And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to teach and I'm going to paint these murals. I'm going to paint a mural and then I'm going to go to Cooper. Like, well, we got to get you ready. You come here every weekend and show me what you're working on. Come here every weekend and show me what you're working on. And I would bring things to their house in Los Feliz and he would tear it up. He would tear it up. He was like, whatever. I don't even remember. I have it all blacked out, but he would tear it up. And then I would go back to Nia's family's house where I was living in Gardena and I would keep working in the garage and I would go back to Los Feliz and show him next weekend and somehow, um, you know, eventually I, I produced a home test and I got the call that I was accepted to Cooper Union and I moved to New York and that changed everything. But but even after MIT, I should say, though, even after MIT, I was I had gone into this research driven program. I produced a written thesis focused on uh, in, informal labor, domestic labor in public space as an act of like, you know, public transformation and whatever. No one understood what the heck I was talking about when I came out. And um, I was too broke to afford a bus pass to cross the Charles River. So when I started looking after children, I couldn't even work for any families in Boston. They had to be within walking distance. And it turned out to be um, uh, humbling and beautiful and valuable in so many ways. Um, I wanna encourage, I was just encouraging my cousin Justin around this a couple of uh, like last week sometime, but you know, like these, these times when we aren't doing what we think we were made to do are not necessarily times when we aren't when we aren't doing something important. You know, like that time in the grocery store, that time working in the grocery store, being like the best bagger, 
building relationships with people and honoring your labor, honoring your labor and honoring the labor of others prepares you to be able to work with teams of people and to honor them and to honor their labor. There's no way that I could work on all these projects, have the 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 the, the benefit and, and the blessing of working on all these projects in different cities with different people, coordinating with my gallerist at Tilton Gallery, coordinating with my gallerists here and now in London too. There's no way that we would hang these shows. Um, there's just no way. There's no way that any of it would work without each and everybody in the process being honored. So we have to learn how to honor ourselves at every step of our journey, I think. So when I hear you explain all of that, it, it really comes across how important relationships are to you, your work. Yes, you have to just make the work and yes, you can do it quietly but your willingness and passion for teaching and reaching out and allowing others to to mentor you and make sure that you know the torch is being passed your your ability to have the maturity to want to seriously learn again in a you know with a more open mind in your 30s you're open to all of these voices and you seem like a connector. You know, it seems like relationships are are really important to you. You know, I guess that probably started, you know, with the this relationship with your mother that is kind of at the, the core of this minute by minute. Yeah. So t tell me more about, about the show. I'm, I, I see the images here. I have a ton of questions, but before... Uh, before we got on this, before we got on this call today, I was I was going through and listening to uh, some more Doobie Brothers and <laughs> good oh for my you. Gosh. And you know, there was there was there was a point where I had this flashback uh, to like 1979, and I was I remember watching What's Happening on television. Yes, yes, Brad, yes, and and. <laughs> And rerun got arrested for trying mm -hmm. to bootleg a Doobie Brothers concert, and mm -hmm. I was like, "Man, that's that's this, and that's in this wheelhouse." Yes, yes, that is one of my favorite episodes of What's Happening, and What's Happening was based in Los Angeles, so it's like that's that's the the oh, yeah. you know the late seventies, early eighties, uh, you know, uh, housing stable Black LA that uh, I grew up in. That four foot cyclone fence in the front of everyone's yard. Yeah, right. yeah, but rerun bootlegging that Doobie Brothers concert, <laughs> and you know the the uh, the 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 space that was given and the grace that was given for teaching, um, mm -hmm. and and the music being so good that rerun couldn't help but pop and lock and drop that huge tape recorder <laughs> out from under his coat. Oh my God, I love it, I love it, Craig. Chef's kiss, chef's kiss, excellent, excellent, excellent. <laughs> Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the, yeah, music, uh, I've, I've been listening to a lot of war lately also, which mm. is also old LA. Um, uh, we get high off the sunshine. LA is my hometown. It's a funky town. Get on down, get on down, get on down. Um, it's a funky town. Um, right. yeah, I'm, I'm a real sucker. I'm a real sucker from my hometown. It's really, I, there's a, there are a number of places that I really love and that in my adventures, I have felt welcomed. I love Athens, um, Greece. I love Denver, Colorado. I love um, I love where I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You know, I've been welcomed. Uh, there's a Steely Dan song, um, uh, "Any World That I'm Wel Any World That I'm Welcome To," but I can't say it's better than the one I come from because the one I come from is so international and so complex and so beautiful. Um, yeah. So uh, Minute by Minute at Night Gallery, it's my second solo show at Night Gallery. Um, and it's been quite an unfolding um, uh, adventure. Uh, I, I was told that it was going to be time for me to have my second show. And my mother had died uh, from untreated cancers uh, here in uh, Southern California during the COVID lockdown, the COVID world emergency, um, the public health emergency while there were still significant travel restrictions and I couldn't get here in time. And um, I just knew, I just knew, you know, Davida Nemiroff uh, and I had a conversation about me having another show. And I was like, it's going to be called Minute by Minute. Um, after the Doobie Brothers album that my mother gave me when she dropped me off in uh, Oakland, uh, 
at the home of a, of a family friend uh, so I could live in her spare room while I went to the San Francisco Art Institute. She let she gave she gave me uh, Jackie Wilson's greatest hits, Van Morrison's Moon Dance, and uh, and um, Minute by Minute. And she Minute by Minute was like my literal favorite, um, and she knew that. <laughs> these these works, you know, they're obviously a, an homage to your mother. Mm-hmm. It, in the end. Was it cathartic or was it was it raw? Was there some closure emotionally? You know, it it feels good to make. I was when I was thinking about I was thinking about talking with you the other day, and you know, again, like trying to trying to think about like how how to make sense of these of this like emotional experience, this emotional and formal experience that I have with my work. How to make sense of it in such a way that it's useful to another artist who might listen to this. Um, and yeah, you know, the piece for me is in the making. The piece for me is in being guided by the making. Um, now that I know what the work needs because of all of these years of adventures, climbing scaffolding, you know, digging through sidewalk piles for usable material, um, figuring out, you know, whether or not polyester is going to be my friend in this situation, you know, like what resists, what wants to resist, what wants to absorb. Um, It's just, I I get to just, I get to be empty. You know, it's like my, my, um, my, my body knows what it needs to do to make certain things happen. I can be completely at the service of a work that might come into the world and have a life of its own. And so the peace comes, peace time comes when the making gets to happen. And, um, and sometimes it takes a while to collect the materials and to know, to collect the materials, whether they be, you know, narrative or, or physical. Um, so yeah, there was a catharsis. There was just a piece. I don't know if I want to say catharsis because I don't want to use the word wrong, but um, yeah, there was a piece that came in the making and watching them, watching them emerge um, and coming, you know, like coming to a place where I, I, I didn't want to leave them. Oh gosh, the best place, the best place to be for me in the making of minute by minute of the paintings for minute by minute was, um, uh, my studio is in East Cambridge, Mass. Uh, I'm sorry. It's my studio is in East Somerville, Massachusetts. It's a neighbor, it's a working class neighborhood, uh, Brazilian and Portuguese, um, uh, uh, is like the, like the dominant culture in the area, but the, and there's this great Mexican food spot where people bring their whole families on Sundays. You know, a place is good when people, when you see like multiple yeah. generations in there, workmen are in there during the day on Sundays, people dress up and, and, and right. but it's all like buffet. It's very fresh. Nothing can, nothing right. keeps for more than two days. And, um, and I, I arrived at a place uh, that I wait to arrive at. And I can't, I can't, I can't force it. I can't hasten it. I have no control over it. But when I'm there, when I'm walking down the street and I could almost be walking with my eyes closed, closed where I can see what the needs are, you know, mm-hmm. like where it's like, okay, now, you know, I need to, this is, this is what that area needs in that corner. Um, I don't know. Like I'm going to, I'm going to need more, now I see it needs more marble paste there, or you know it needs a it it wants it wants a like with here here to love you here to love you sat in my studio for two months just kind of like growing and and that one I wanted really I I tried so hard not to overtouch it you know like there's a there's um right. there's a fragility there's a like a pale tenderness that I really wanted to protect and maintain like the inside of a hand, like the fleshy inside of a hand. I really wanted to. Well, there's this soft palette of like a a floral still life, right? I mean, it, and if you, if you overwork it too much, if there are too many layers that, Mm -hmm. you know, that luminosity just isn't going to be there. Right. Yeah. 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 So I guess, I guess some sort of catharsis is arrived at when, um, when they are completely running the show and when they're the, the, uh, the, the architecture has been established that, you know, all the other math stuff, you know, like working with the, the frame maker, you know, working with the craftsman who's making the frames and the cat skills, uh, having those numbers done. I know that my dimensions are right. 
And, you know, the hypothesis is that eventually when these two things meet and we strap them down, that they're going to line up, you know, once, once all that other technical stuff is out of the way and it can just be like, you know, what is this surface need to be built? There was one piece uh, here at the Western world from uh, uh, across the universe that um, is about it's about the same size as Here to Love You. Um, and I struggled with it because I tried to, it's very yellow. It's a very golden piece, but I tried to, um, I tried to do with it what I finally felt like I successfully did with here to love you. And there were nights when I couldn't sleep because I was afraid once again, that I had made the wrong move, that I had overplayed my hand, that I had overpowered, you know, some section with too deep of pigment that I couldn't turn back from because the surface is so sensitive. You know, it's like, it's like a fresco surface. The surface is so, it's so, it wants to absorb so much that when the absorption has happened, I cannot turn it back around. I have got to, every move has to be intentional at that point. And um, I was so mad at myself for overpowering it and, and making it flat. And then someone, someone talked to me. Um, I heard someone talking about the beauty of the Rocky mountains is not that they are all the same, but that the beauty of the Rocky mountains is, is it lies in their peaks and their valleys. They go up and they go down. That's what makes them exciting to look at. And, and, and from my walk, I would walk sometimes from East, from East Somerville to Cambridge. And in doing so, I walked through the Harvard campus. And uh, for some reason, at that point in the early summer, this, this, this one bunch of trees, their leaves were like yellow and brown, but you know, global warming. Their leaves looked like they were like early fall, but it was, anyways, at night, the way that they were lit up, they were kind of like sparkling. I saw like yellow, I saw orange, I saw green. They were, it, they were rising and falling. And in and, and, and that moment, I was like, that's it, that's it. I have to go back because I'm working with these half tone lines. Everything can be flat and, and and predictable. How do I make it rise and fall like the Rocky Mountains? Um, and so I was able to sleep well, get up the next day, come back and give the painting what it needed, which were just these very washed out, very tender, um, just brushes of Indian yellow, mm -hmm. fluorescent yellow, um, cad yellow light but very washed down, very gentle, very gentle. And the whole thing just came to life. So that's where I get to have my fun. Yeah. So tell me more about the halftone, because like when I look, it looks like you're using it in different ways because like, you know, from, from a distance, you know, I'm imagining that, you know, it, it almost appears that as though they, these things have been screen printed <laughs> and then, yeah. right. But yeah. well, once once I get up close and I'm looking at it, I'm like what this is this is brushwork yeah and I think you do it looks like you do some image transfers right like onto yeah. like transparency and you know, like I've dabbled before with like even using like packing tape to you know you know to grab an image and wash off the paper on the back and you know that sort of thing right yes I, I know like exactly yeah. <laughs> and I feel like I've seen that hanging off some awnings in, you in have. Denver, right? Yeah, and yeah. And so tell me more about how you make these choices on how to go about utilizing it. Like, are you, you know, is it important for you to have your brush in your hand? Do you ever use a screen? Is the transparency, you know, only with that that mylar or uh, transparent material? What mm -hmm. What's in your mind there? <laughs> Printmaking. Printmaking's on my mind. Um, I was super influenced by, uh, you know, again, like getting to watch my body's reactions to things. I had a very significant reaction to learning uh, practices and disciplines of printmaking when I was at Cooper Union. So, yeah, SFAI dropped out in, in 1999. Uh, I got into Cooper. I applied to Cooper and got in in 2005. Most of my credits were not transferable. Cooper Union does not play. Um, I was one of six transfer students and I thought I was going to be, I was like, okay, so, so that means I'm going to be basically a second year when I get there because I did a whole year at the San Francisco Art Institute and I did foundation year. I don't need to do that again. They were like, uh, we'll take a credit and a half. <laughs> you, you're going to be in the general population with everybody else who just came out of high school, you know, like, like come here, here we are down here on earth. Let's go, you know? Right. And so uh, second year, so I was like 25, 26 in my first year, 26 is 27 is second year when you get to start 
choosing classes that define your curriculum and the beauty, one of the, the beautiful things that I really appreciate about uh, the Cooper Union for the advancement of science and art um, is that in the School of Art, we learn through a generalist uh, ideology. You know, we don't have to um, declare majors. Uh, we're expected to move around and to make however that making is going to present itself. We are free to make, but the but you you should be making. Um, that's the purpose of being there. And so my first year, my first, uh, what is it? That first semester of my second year at Cooper, you know, very, very happy to be at my dream school, but also very afraid, you know, very afraid. Like I hear a lot of us, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of young artists tend to be, if we get to go to school, we're like, okay, what skill can I come out of here with so that I can work for someone else, you know? graphic design, you know, and I, and, and I say this like without any at all, I don't, I mean, uh, without any disparagement at all to the, uh, extraordinary beauty and complexity of design. Um, uh, you know, later on in my life, I would get to, you know, work alongside, uh, students at the, at, at the Yale, uh, school of art who were in graphic design, you know, it's, it's a, it's a whole other language that is not my natural language, you know? So, but at, so at the time, again, you know, any, being led by fear is going to get me certain things and being led by faith is going to get me other things, right? So my first semester, I'm totally driven by fear and I'm taking graphic design, hoping that I'm going to have some magical, you know, savant experience with Photoshop. And I don't, I do not understand but I, but I'm, I'm, I'm in class with people like a, an artist named Mark Nares, who was just brilliant. He was colorblind, and he was brilliant, and he really did every. He did mostly everything by hand. You know, he took a stance as a designer to actually work by hand. It was beautiful. I did not have that. Second semester, though, I started taking silkscreen printmaking. And then I was starting to see much like you know being someone who got to be at SFAI and actually cut and paste. Uh, eight millimeter and sixteen mil millimeter film in the in the in the editing base that we had there. Um, I can because I did that by hand. I understood Final Cut Pro, and then I understood uh, Premiere um, and the language. You know, cut and paste here, blah blah blah. Even the the little uh, the little um, icons of the razor blade. There's no reason why I would naturally understand what a razor blade icon would translate to for film except I had actually done it by hand already. Um, with graphic design, you know, I, when I went into, when I went to our fifth floor and started learning uh, silkscreen printmaking, I saw all of these processes that um, I saw what it meant in Photoshop, basically. I was like, oh, this is what they mean. Oh, this is what the layers mean. The layers in the, in the, in the, uh, in the application mimic the process of layering that we get from printing and registering with clear and frosted mylar. Oh, 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 oh. And so again, I learned, I just happened to learn physically by doing, and I, and I had this very um, excited reaction to getting to, you know, work with Lorenzo Clayton and Scott Nobles and um, Cara Eduardo up in the print shop uh, and Dave Gleason um, and experimental printmaking that really, it just really changed the game. And it also got me really excited about the history of the print and the history of the publication. It took me back to those three years that I was in Catholic school, learning about Martin Luther and the 95 theses, you know, learning about the, the advent of the printing press and the, you know, and, and how it initiates a, the great schism, um, in the Catholic church, you know, like that, that, you know, the idea of multiplicity and the sharing of language, you know, the, the sharing of religious texts outside of Latin that the common people couldn't understand, you know? So it's like the, when I, when I, when I felt plugged into that history of people's work, that printmaking is so much about people, you know, publication, making public for the people, um, you know, that's, that's ringing all my bells. So I just stayed in the print shop. And from there, I started to see, um, you know, I saw translucency, I saw layering. Um, I began to understand color in a different way. And then when I learned about the halftone line and the halftone dots that, you know, we have to take an image, we have to have a, a clean image to, to, to translate through photo emulsion onto that screen to burn the screen with sunlight, essentially, to target it with sunlight to burn the image into it, the image has to be clear. It has to either be a dot or it gets, it can also be a line. And then once I learned about the halftone line, well, then that got me all excited about the fact that 
with the origins of of copper of, of copper plate um, of etching, the origins of etching, a line is all you need to start the possibility of another world in the second plane. You know, the, in the second dimension, we have this flat thing. This is what's so exciting about figure drawing, about really learning figure drawing, is that you get to be challenged with a two-dimensional surface. How are you going to make that round? There's nothing about the human figure that is straight. That's what machines do. Nothing that is nothing that is natural. There's nothing about the human figure that is straight. You know, so I, I learned as a as a as a kid in figure drawing class to resist my compulsion to over, you know, to over darken and outline a shape like a stick figure because that's not real. You know, the 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 human figure, the human body is imperfect. It's perfectly imperfect. So I get to, you know, lighten up my pressure. I get to press down a little bit harder. And all of that irregularity. Uh, starts over time, even though it feels foreign to me initially, it creates the illusion of roundness. And now we have a flat surface that makes us feel like we can go into it and put our hands around something. That's magic. That's magic. So if you have a if you have a copper plate that's flat and you take a you know you take a chisel and a, and a needle to like all these things that have been fashioned by the people who came before us, and they start making a line here and a line there. And this line crosses here and that line crosses there. And before you know it, we have the illusion of deep space. That a line on a surface is the beginning of the illusion of deep space. That's what I love about the halftone line. And then what I learned as I continue to make these irregular surfaces, you know, I want to make these surfaces that don't exist otherwise in the world because I'm all, you know, paranoid about purpose. So it's like, am I doing something that's already been done? Then who needs me? But am I making something that doesn't already exist in the earth? And am I, you know, am I taking a piece of earth and putting it into the surface, whatever? So I make these irregular surfaces that by their nature resist the needs of a silk screen, of a silk screen, which needs flatness. So it was through uh, being invited to um, the Institute of Contemporary Art at, at, at Virginia Commonwealth University by cura curator Amber Seva, who really wanted me to do one of my window drawing pieces. Uh, there in Richmond, Virginia, it was during that process of listening to the janitorial staff, asking the janitorial staff who like the like the security staff at the Wexner Center all happened to be black. And I asked them, you know, who in this historically black neighborhood that had been, you know, gentrified into unrecognizability, um, who would you like to see monumentalized? You know, we're around at that at that time, we're around the corner from Monument Avenue, where all these Confederate monuments are. And, you know, it's a very like, a, you know, electric, it's a, it's, it's a historically charged crossroads. Um, and uh, so I, so I asked the people who were from there, I'm not from there. And I need to ask them, who would you like to see monumentalized on the glass of this building? And they told me, and, um, but then how am I going to do it? You know, I, I'm, I can, I'm really good at drawing freehand. I am, I am really good at that, but this would, th this would be a lot. You know, this would be a lot to 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 translate recognizably for the people for whom these 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 figures are significant. I had to take the photographs and I had to translate them into half tone lines, and that's when I started understanding that I needed to 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 enlarge them. I had to project the half tone line onto the surface, and then again, you know, it's like what are the needs? So so in that situation, I had to work at night because I couldn't project during the day. Um, uh, Andy at the VCU would line would line the the panels of glass I was working on. He'd line them with butcher paper on one side so that we could project at night and and work. Um, and that was that ended up being the turning point when I finally understood. Aha! I need to project. And at that time, I was using oil sticks inspired by Joan Jonas's drawings with oil sticks. I, that turned me in that direction. But then I found that um, when I tried to employ the oil sticks onto my surfaces they were now a mismatch. It was now like they were like, you know, sticky and chunky. And that's what brought finally brought me back to, you know, painting as I had understood it, you know, as a younger, as a, as a younger person, as a, you know, a compulsive art making person as a student um, that I had to, the, the, the nature of the system that was developing in front of me based on these urges and these experiences that I had arrived at a place where I needed to return to painting, painting. I needed to return to capital P painting because the surface demanded it. The only way to translate these images was to was to build a surface and let it be what it was going to be and then to absorb pigment into it. And now we're back at traditional painting, which I had resisted 
for however long because I make things complicated for myself. But um, yeah, so the halftone line, all the halftone lines in the work are um, painted in into the surfaces, and then they then they cross hatch with a PVC vinyl. You know, these are archival prints onto PVC vinyl that we work with a print shop in. Um, oh, it's they're not really a print shop. We work with a a visual visual solutions company in New York City to um, print them onto the vinyl that, um, you know, when I when I first got to New York and saw bodega strips, like the refrigerated flaps and bodegas for, right. you know, open refrigerated sections. I uh -huh. remember thinking, I got to figure out how to turn those into paintings one day. <laughs> yeah, I see that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that's how they that's how they arrived. Um, Taking inspiration from everywhere. Well, everywhere that a lot of places that are public, you know, every everywhere that's public, you know, if if, if if muralism is not the only way to make a public work, then what else do I need to do? You know, what else is all around me? Um, sure. You know, how do I how do I, uh, you know, love where I've come from and also let go of my attachment to one way of making? Yeah, I see some lace in these pieces. Yeah. Is that something you have used much of, or is that something that was kind of a nod to your mother? That was, um, you know, a lucky, again, a very lucky uh, outcome. During my time in Colorado, I made some friends. And one of them, uh, Vanessa uh, Barkas, who's a, who's a goldsmith, comes from a family of craftswomen, um, a Jewish pioneer family, which I, wow. I'd never heard a story like this before, but... Her people go back so far that they were in like covered wagons traveling between Kansas and Colorado, like very, very deep. And her great aunt was a seamstress and loved to embroider and to knit tacking. I'd never heard that term before, tacking. Um, so her great aunt died and left this like mountain of archive worthy uh, bedding from the 1930s, the 1940s. And Vanessa was kind enough to trust me with uh, like four pieces. I pulled four pieces from the from the things that she pulled out in these boxes, and I used them to make the pieces that employ lace. Uh, Vanessa's wow. uh, great aunt did that. Wow, you know the, this exhibit starts with the relationship with your mother, but it's it's really tying in all of these relationships that you're making along the way, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which is, uh, it's totally, I think I mentioned to you before as it's, uh, I'm starting to, you know, in the absence of my mother and I've, I've been having to, you know, like people grow up, I've been having to like, let go of my, of a certain sort of attachment to my mother for like a long time. But, you know, now in her, in her absence, I can feel her, I can feel her and, and see her in me. You know, she was, uh, yeah, I'm I'm totally a product of the way that I watched her build relationships. Uh, uh, she relationships of class solidarity, of you know mutual uplifting of 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 women, of respect for trade work, of respect for labor, um, and of um, you know disdain for injustice, disdain for police violence. Um, you know she was always a. She was very present. You know she was very present, a present observer of of history. And, uh, and, um, yeah, she just had, she was able, she was able to access people in all kinds of ways based in this, um, you know, solidarity centered, um, practicality, you know, like we're, we're, we're people, we're all people and we're trying to, we are, we are, we are people, we're trying to make it and we are inside of histories that are larger than us. And she was always very aware of that. But I did want to tell you about something though, that I didn't mention Please. before, which is that, um, yeah, so there's minute by minutes that unfolded, you know, unbeknownst to me, um, as it needed to. Uh, it was not precipitated by a research methodology. Actually, it was. Oh my God, because I were because I interviewed my mother ten years ago when I was a student at MIT. But those conversations were about labor and our family's history of labor in Los Angeles. And the funny thing is, you know, I'm using we are using that audio. Um, I'm I'm working with uh, an opera director named Alexander Gideon, uh, G-E-D-E-O-N. And he's been, uh, we've been, we've been talking about collaborating for a couple of years. I've been trying to figure out how to share space with people of other disciplines um, uh, in lieu of, you know, the revaluation of city centers that make it harder and harder for, you know, 
just like creative people to get together in community and just experiment. So I have access, you know, I'm, I'm offered, I'm afforded access to these gallery spaces in, in, you know, New York City and Los Angeles and soon in London. How can I share that space with musicians and dancers and theater people? Um, so that's all I thought it was going to be. It ends up being that I'm the actor, <laughs> that I'm the performer and he's been training me. And, um, uh, you know, I happen to have these very degraded recordings of my conversations via Skype with my mother in um, that I that I did as a part of my thesis work uh, to get to finish MIT. And um, she's talking about my family's history, exactly where I am right now. Right now I'm on Broadway and Olympic, downtown in the old theater district, which, you know, hugs the corner, hugs the edge of the warehouse district, the fashion district, the garment district, and um, just all these areas of industrial supply chain um, uh, crossover and exchange. So she's talking about my family's history from like the 1940s that she, she, she covers the, the, the stock market crash, you know, they're coming here to California. My uncles who worked as masons and day laborers and my aunts who worked as my great aunts who worked as domestics and how all these people who worked around this area, uh, all had relationships with each other because they had to, they were, they were oppressed working people, uh, who otherwise were, you know, trying to feed whole families on ten dollars a week. So she talked about how, you know, the 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 people at the meat mart, you know, the leftover meat would be like, you know, separated and shared among the laborers who were around, and then they would spread it to their family members wherever they were out here um, in LA. That it's these relationships that allow people to survive. But so I have these recordings, and unfortunately, it's all I have. I have that. I have the. I have minute by minute. I now have her camera. Um, uh, I don't have her books, you know, like there were, there were in, in the chaos of her death, uh, during the lockdown, a, a lot was lost and I was not here to evaluate things. It just happened. Yeah. So, um, my, my director, who's also a musician has taken the audio from these recordings from 10 years ago that I had to pull off of a computer that, rec that needs to be plugged into work, you know, like an old PC that like that, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I pulled these audio, I pulled these videos off. I give them to Alexander. He takes the audio from my mother's converse, these conversations between me and my mother 10 years ago. And he has made these sonic collages mixing our voices with the tracks from minute by minute. So my alter ego, Tommy Tonight, that emerged while I was at Skowhegan in 2019, that alter ego, that drag character actually emerged the day that I found out that my mother moved to Bakersfield. Um, and in fact, let me send this to you. Um, I, I learned that she had moved to Bakersfield, California, where we don't have any relatives. She had been priced out of Los Angeles, where, you know, I lived in the same fourplex apartment my entire life. You know, I grew up with extraordinary housing stability that increasingly, you know, more and more people um, are unable to secure. Um, and, uh, you know, so so she was out, you know, she got pushed out of Los Angeles and she moved very far away in a very isolated location. And um, and I was afraid for her. And um, but I had no control over it because, you know, she's like she's the grown up. <laughs> she made her decision. And um, and this this character emerged so that I could go to this party that we were having at Skowhegan. And it gave me a break. Um, it became like a like a container for I, I, I now understand him as having been a container for anticipatory grief. And he loves the music that my mother and I love. You know, he loves mm -hmm. love songs. He loves, uh, he loves R and B. He loves, he loves, he loves Michael McDonald. You know, like he right. loves, he loves love. You know, he's a, he's pensive. He's deeply feeling. He's also funny. Um, and uh, so my, while we so, were rehearsing so he's, last uh, night. He's your Sasha Fierce. Right. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> Which I didn't think I would ever have that. You know, I have so much I have a high regard for uh, for people, uh, for artists who who have some other place where they can be. You know, it's like my other place to be is in the making. I didn't think that I had a performative alter ego or that I ever would. But it just kind of like happened because I, I actually like while I was up in the in the mountains of Maine, I really could not. Um, I, I can't even articulate how 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 fear filled I became for my mother's safety. You know, it was like there's just so much happening here. The fact that she's been pushed out of our hometown, the fact that she's so far away, we don't have any people but Baker, there. Bakersfield's a, a a rather different demographic 
it's kind of different culturally. Absolutely. In the agrarian side of the state yes. than it is in LA. Very grapes of wrath. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so Tommy emerges and and then he emerges again while I'm in Greece and he emerges again when I come back to Los Angeles for my first show. And, you know, this just this 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 stuff has happened. I don't I don't even know. I don't have a formal I don't have a formal explanation for him at the time, but um, or for most of this time, like until now. But uh, so Alexander finds this character to be fascinating um, and Alexander has developed a methodology of teaching and facilitating opera direction through embodiment, through the embodiment of recordings and uh, the embodiment of emotion that's contained in recordings. So he made this, this, this collage track, pulling parts of each song from minute by minute, prioritizing Michael McDonald's uh, vocals, which Tommy tonight is embodying and mixing them with these conversations that my mother is having with me about what it was like to be a teenage girl going to work with her great aunts to clean homes of wealthy white people in Los Angeles at the time of the rise of the black power movement. And you know what it meant to search for identity outside of use value as black people and as black women in this place. And, um, you know, and how and how little they were paid and, you know, what a big deal it was that as a teenage girl, she insisted upon being paid two fifty an hour instead of a dollar and how it made them mad. But it did, you know, too, she said too bad. They didn't like that too bad, you know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. So we're doing this performance tomorrow. The show opens today, uh, you know, opens to the public today. And then the gallery is kind enough to open up on a Sunday. Uh, so we can have this kind of, um, it's kind of turned into this, uh, you know, I didn't get to participate in my mother's memorial. Um, so this show minute by minute has kind of like inadvertently become my opportunity to, uh, I don't even know if it's saying goodbye, but it's, you know, it's, an, it's become an opportunity. You know, I always ask myself with all the, all the things that confuse me, cause I get confused by so much. I always stop and ask myself, can art handle this for me? Over the years, I've asked, can art handle this for me? I'm homesick. I'm homesick. Can art handle this for me? Um, you know, I want I want to be of use to the public. You know, for I want to make work that's meant to be of use for a public good and public narrative. Can art handle this for me? You know, I I don't I don't feel I don't feel safe in this space to talk about how heartbroken I am. Can art handle this for me? You know, can abstraction handle this for me? Can printmaking help me with this? You know, and 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 not even in, not even just like face value, but can the history of this discipline help me with this? And it and it never lets me down. Um, and with minute by minute, with minute by minute, I only started to understand in July that this project is about a public health. You know, the area of public concern that is addressed by this is uh, public health and survival after disaster. Um, and I was so close to it that I didn't know that this project would end up being, you know, uh, it, another carrier of the research methodology of inquiry, um, because it, it's kind of like emerged after the fact that, um, you know, my mother's death is classified properly as an excess death. We only reached zero excess deaths in, in this country. I think it was like July 17, which means that for the previous three years, there have been an abnormal number of deaths beyond COVID, of excess deaths, you know, from all the people who weren't treated, all the screening that didn't happen, all the domestic violence, the car crashes, all these crazy things that were exacerbated by the strain put on the um, put on the uh, the, uh, the the healthcare system and put on put on society an unprepared society. Um, so uh, yeah, this is this is not just. It turns out that this is not just a memorial for me or for my mother, it turns out that there are, that there are probably, it will probably, it will likely not be possible to count how many of us have lost, how many we have lost during this time. Um, but I'm glad that the space has been made available by Night Gallery for this to play out. Well, I mean, I, I always, uh, always like to say that uh, the best artwork comes from a place of vulnerability and that viewers don't judge an artist for their vulnerability. They, they find commonality and connection with that vulnerability. And 
Um, I, I hope that the, the viewers that show up to your show, um, you know, get that emotional connection and that they're moved. Uh, the show is minute by minute, September 30th to November 4th, uh, the night gallery in LA Tamashi, uh, again, a, a real pleasure. And, um, I can't wait to talk to you for another hour. I look forward to it and I'm going to come ready with my questions because I will have had a nap. <laughs> that's all the time we have for this week you've been listening to art sense you can find the show on apple Podcasts, itunes google play stitcher radio spotify or your favorite podcast app if you've enjoyed this podcast be sure to subscribe and while you're there please rate the show and leave a quick review your feedback is the key to other folks finding us And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.